very much, Honorable uh, Yariga, and I hope you're well. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Honorable, can you hear me? Hello, Honorable. Uh, the, the line went bad. So, Honorable, can you hear me now? Uh, we still have that difficulty. So we'll get him back on the line. The line just went back automatically. So I'm saying, uh, like he's saying, he said he tried to get an explanation for why the scope of work increased by 36.9%, but the cost increased by 84%. And he was told that national security is the reason they can't explain to him. So they can't explain to him because of national security. Uh, that's the reason the governor gave him. Thank you, Honorable, once again. I hope this time the line stays good. Well, I hope so. Yeah. I hope you're well. Um, I'm okay. Thank you. Mm. Uh, well, uh, l let's start with, um, of course, the last time we spoke, you said we're still ex expecting the response of the governor to your issue, uh, to the questions you raised in this particular petition to the Office of Special Prosecutor. Uh, you said the governor said, told you that because of national security, they can't explain to you why? Exactly. I mean, the governor sent a response to me in which he said that he is unable to explain um, the variation in the price adjustment uh, because uh, some elements of the design he cannot uh, disclose to us uh, for national security reasons because I had asked him to give us the details of the BOQ uh, and then also the the designs uh, and from the design you can see or be able to tell uh, if there is some justification for the variation in scope of works which was about 36.9% resulting in uh, a variation in the price from 121.8 million to 222.7 million United States dollars so he responded saying that for national security reasons he will not be able to tell me the details of the designs. So well, uh, it just left us with no option but to send the matter to the Office of, Office of Special Prosecutor because uh, I can only think of corruption or some corruption related offense uh, in the procurement. And uh, the Office of Special Prosecutor is the one that has jurisdiction to deal with such matters. So yesterday I sent a letter to the special prosecutor making a formal complaint. I hope to hear from him very soon, probably inviting me to come and then uh, provide further details of my complaint so that the matter can be taken up by the special prosecutor. Uh, and I'll come back to the Office of the Special Prosecutor, but even when uh, you're told that we cannot provide detailed, specific explanations, they sometimes give you broad strokes, like tell you, give you some reasons that perhaps will not go into the details. Did he at least try? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, he, he repeated, in essence, elements of what he had earlier state, stated in his uh, press briefing. If you recall, the governor had a press briefing uh, some time ago and tried to explain the cost build-up and essentially said that uh, they had uh, costed the project uh, per square meter. And if you recall, he gave a figure of about $2,200 or $300 uh, per square meter. So it was based on that that I said, okay, if the project price is uh, uh, $222 million uh, and uh, you have uh, $2,200 per square meter, it means that overall we are looking at a project of about 107,000 square meters. And then, you know, uh, I went back to some other portions of his own statement in which he had said that the initial project was for 73,000 square meters. And there are three different prices. He also stated at a certain point that initially they had submitted uh, a request to the Public Procurement Authority to procure the project 
at a price of $100 million thereabout, and that the PPA arbitrarily and without consulting them, you know, slashed the figure to about $81 million, if you recall. But then we ended up seeing that the same project that you yourself proposed a figure of about $100 million, for which the PPA thought you should use uh, $81 million, uh, subsequently gets awarded at uh, $121 million. Then you later on also uh, admit that the project price now stands at $222 million. So basically, you know, there are three price uh, uh, provisions. What PPA said they should do it at $81 million. What they themselves had requested from PPA to do it at $100 million. What it got awarded at which was $121 million. And then at that point, so you have three prices, 81, 100, and 121, for the same square meters, I presume. Then now there is a variation, and then the variation leads to a price escalation of $222 million. And when you are asked to come and explain, you come and tell the public that, oh, you use the square meter to calculate and per square meter is about $2,200. Uh, so we simply take your new price of 222 and then we um, we divide it by your square meter, and it gives us 107,000 uh, square meters. Then we take the initial 73,000 square meters at a price of uh, 121 million, and then we see the movement in terms of the price from 121 million to 222 million and we see that the movement is about 84 percent then we take the movement in scope of work and say we move from um uh 73,000 to 100 and you know uh 7,000 square meters and then we see that uh, that movement is just uh, a little over 36 percent so how is it that a 36% movement in scope of works has led us to an 84% movement in the price? Explain. Then he says, I can't tell you anything for national security considerations. Clearly, clearly something something fishy has happened. And that is why I decided to go to the Office of Special Prosecutor. Very interesting. Um, I'll come to the point where you are saying that uh, for you, you saw corruption and corruption-related offenses, but... Um, the reason they gave national security, ideally for the ordinary Ghanaian, that's how a lot of public uh, uh, officers explain things away. National security and then supposed to end there. And everybody keeps saying that the Bank of Ghana building is the national security installment. Um, is that a reason enough for you as a member of parliament for somebody to decide to withhold information from you? Hold on, I mean. Uh, that's why I decided to go to the Office of Special Prosecutor because uh, we cannot let the matter end there. You, 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 I'm not the kind of person who just tell me national security considerations and then get past me with that kind of, uh, uh, you know, excuse my language, rubbish. So um, I will have the matter, you know, gone into by the Special Prosecutor. I mean, we will end up in the Supreme Court on this matter because if they come to the Special prosecutor, and then they raise the question of national security. Uh, it won't end there. We'll go to the Supreme Court for the Supreme Court to determine whether, you know, uh, the, you know, under the Constitution, the Supreme Court can compel them to uh, bring the documents and the records for it to be examined, and then uh, uh, based on that, whatever decision that the Supreme Court uh, needs to take, they will take. So, I mean, I'm not going to accept that kind of uh, answer, and I insist that. The special prosecutor looks into the matter, and I will make sure that he actually looks into the matter. It seems you are prepared for what is to come. You are already predicting where this will go. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, trust me. When I start the fight, I know where to go, and then I'm prepared uh, to get it to that point. Well, it's, it's different to say somebody is uh, you, to to be denied explanation for you to arrive at the conclusion that there's corruption, corruption-related offenses in here. 
Yes, you were not given the explanation you wanted, but is that strong enough for you to start really raising issues of suspected corruption, corruption-related offenses? Well, I mean, some things are so basic. It's, it's common sense. Um, if you look at the, the prices, you can see that something has happened. And, you know, given the level of integrity that you expect of a central bank governor and his team, if, you know, you provide prices that you cannot explain um, and you are given the opportunity to explain, you know, to clear yourself, you should be in a hurry to explain it. You should not be running, you know, under the cloak of national security. I, 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 as a member of parliament, I've sworn a uh, oath of secrecy, you know, uh, as a parliamentarian, documents come to us which are confidential documents. We have to look at it and never tell anybody what we saw. And so I qualify to 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 see what, what is there. You could you could give me the document, but label it as confidential, so that if I leak it, I can be prosecuted for for leaking it. I mean, so those are things that you could do if you really have an explanation. So clearly. They don't have an explanation. Uh, there's corruption. Uh, I have no doubt about that. But the law doesn't say that I must prove corruption before I call on the special prosecutor to intervene. The law simply says if I suspect, and I have reasonable grounds to suspect that there has been corruption, and clearly my grounds are very reasonable, there are price inconsistencies, price that cannot be explained. I have written to the institution requesting the institution to explain. The institution gets back to me and says, I will not explain. And I ask why. Says, oh, national security considerations. Clearly, you have aroused suspicion. And I can be legitimately, you know, suspicious that you've parted the price. That's why you cannot explain the price. So I'm then on very, very firm legal grounds, what I'm doing. So if the institution has sent an an explanation labeled confidential and you were convinced by the explanation they had in that confidential document, you would not have taken this step at all? Oh, not at all. Why would I do that? I mean, I, 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 I do not personally hate the, the governor. I actually don't even know him, to be frank with you. I only know him from television, from, you know, newspapers and from watching him, you know, um, on, in the media, I don't know him personally, so I have no reason to hate him. If I hate him, it's because he has mismanaged the finances of this country, caused inflation, and then brought untold hardship to ordinary people. I hate that. But as a person, I don't hate him as a person, but I hate the policies that he's implemented that has brought this country to where it is. So if he gave me an explanation, uh, I have that level of integrity to. Uh, publicly say that I've seen the explanation. It makes sense to me. Uh, I'm not, you know, allowed by law to give the details out. But uh, what I have seen convinces me that um, the price change is reasonable. And so I dropped the matter. But if you also refuse to give me explanation, I have every justification as a citizen and as a member of parliament to continue to pursue the matter until there's full accountability. I, I understand the point where you are dragging in the board the governor but the two deputies uh, why why did you decide to add them to the equation the the the, the two deputies are also members of the board okay the two are also members of the board and within the setup the three should be held accountable for anything um so the the chair the chairman and then the, the governor and his deputies and then they are also members of the board and uh, the entire board is definitely involved in the decisions relating to the variation in the prices and etc and approvals of payments and etc so they are all part of it and then of course uh Mesos, uh gold key properties limited is, is definitely part of it i mean they would have given the price variations and they are accepting the contract on the basis of those prices so if there's any um, uh, conspiracy to, to to steal public funds they are definitely part of it and that's why i insist that uh, gold key properties must also be investigated and then the project consultants too you have added yeah, the consultants definitely i mean they would have advised on the variations and they would have approved the variations to the, 
the bank, and, and so they must all be invited to answer questions why the, that variation and to explain you know, how that variation has uh, been arrived at uh, at that price. Uh, you, you say you are still yet to hear from the special prosecutor. Yes, that's because I sent uh, the report to him uh, two days ago. So um, I, I believe that very soon they will be getting in touch with me. Is this a show of faith in the work of the special prosecutor that you are petitioning him, or you find that per what you suspect, you have no other place to go than him? We passed a law establishing the Office of Special Prosecutor. Actually, I was on the committee that worked on the law. And I know exactly, uh, in terms of our country's institutional arenas, which institution has jurisdiction in this matter. And it is the Special Prosecutor. It's not the Attorney General. It is the Special Prosecutor. So that's the place that I have to go to, by law. And I have to act according to law. Well, we'll be expecting to hear from the special prosecutor. But um, let me move you from this and uh, move you to another issue that happened in Parliament yesterday. Uh, yesterday, CI was led by the Electoral Commission creating the Guan constituency. Um, uh, what do you make of this move by the Electoral Commission? And uh, would you have the full backing of Honorable Ayariga by extension the minority? Yeah, of course, yes. That's the matter that uh, should have been... Uh, addressed even before the last election. And if you recall, um, we have consistently called for the Electoral Commission to do the need for, to get this uh, instrument laid in Parliament for the creation of uh, the constituency. And so uh, it's a matter that automatically has uh, our blessing. It's an imperative, it's a constitutional imperative that when you divide um, uh, constituencies in such a way that they fall within uh, two separate uh, districts. You must re-demarcate the constituencies in such a way that no constituency falls within two uh, political districts. And this is what happened in that case. And that is what has necessitated uh, what the EC is doing now. It's, it's a constitutional injunction. And already, I I, I understand there there's a group at um, that enclave, Santo Kofi Akwafololobi Likpe enclave, that is saying that the EC is okay because they are saying they are in court and they feel that the EC should wait for the court to determine the matter that they've sent to court before they come to parliament. Um, can that be an issue that can be raised to stop the process in parliament? The process started yesterday, it cannot be stopped. Um, if they want to stop it, they should go to the court that they are in and then ask the court to issue an injunction restraining the EC. I see. And let me ask further, should, should that be all? Because you said, everybody keeps saying, in fact, uh, the, the, that, the law lecturer that is in the US, I think Kwekwaza, keeps saying it's a cardinal sin that, must, that cannot be forgiving. Uh, is doing a, a constituency. In fact, the speaker spoke about it yesterday. It's just saying we are we are carving into a new constituency enough. Should there be some form of accountability beyond that? Well, I mean, there are some matters that it's difficult to fashion out accountability beyond correcting the error. I mean, when you say accountability, what what are you really going to do? Are you going to say that the issue should be made to pay compensation to uh, all the people in the new constituency who did not get the chance to vote for a member of parliament? Are you saying that uh, um, resources that ought to to go to a constituency um, uh, for a four-year period because they never had a, a constituency and therefore those resources never came to them? Are you saying that there should be some you know, um, financial compensation to that uh, geographical space by way of uh, uh, budgetary allocations. I mean, what, how do you fashion out a compensation scheme for such uh, a default? So, really, in some cases, just correcting it uh, becomes, in my opinion, um, the most appropriate remedy. Uh, better late than never, um, that is being corrected now so that. Um, it is within the scope of uh, the work of the Electoral Commission in the organization of the next election. That's, that's what I think. 
people may have different views. Um, the people in the communities may have uh, a reason why they are calling for some other form of compensation. If it is reasonable, I'm sure the court in which their matter is will uh, review it and take a decision. Will the creation of further constituencies receive your backing? If, for example, the EC comes back with mm, some more constituencies to be created, would you jump behind the EC? One, I don't think that there's a constitutional imperative to create further constituencies. There's, there's really no reason to create further constituencies. And if you ask me personally, I would say that at this stage in our affairs, uh, it would be unreasonable to increase the number of uh, parliamentary seats. Uh, I know a lot of people are clamoring for uh, seats here and there, but you must relate, you know, um, the expenditure on governors to the income of the country and the productivity of the institution, really. I mean, so I, I, I don't think that it is reasonable at this stage, at this time, to contemplate, you know, the creation of additional constituencies beyond correction of this constitutional problem that was created four years ago. So definitely, I will tell you that there's no way that I will back any effort to create uh, additional constituencies at this stage. Oh, that's great. Um, let me conclude by asking, I know we didn't tell you about this before I'm raising these issues with you, uh, but this happened within your enclave, in fact, in, particularly in Garo. Um uh, I know you are somebody who does not take kindly to abuse and constitutional wrongs, among others. I, I know you've heard about what has happened in Garo. What are your thoughts? Well, no, I was I was very involved in what has happened in Garo. Um, I I receive calls when there's an incident, and then I I am involved in the management of the incident. I think that the military have not done well by. Uh, the way that they have behaved, going there in their numbers to um, physically assault, you know, innocent citizens, civilians, women and children and men. Uh, and I think that this is a matter that I have publicly condemned already, and I will repeat my condemnation here. I, I do not encourage uh, young people to defy important state institutions such as uh, the military or the national security. But at the same time also, I don't think that the national security or the military have any justification to go rampaging, go amok, and and in, beat up innocent people. So that's why you are called national security. You have an intelligence apparatus. If there's a crime, you are supposed to use your intelligence capabilities to really try and define who the criminal is and fish that person out and punish that person as an example to deter the rest of us in society. But if you have become so incompetent that you think the only way to uh, address uh, misconduct is to just go and then, you know, surround the whole town and beat up everybody and go away, then you know, you are sending us back to the law of the jungle. <laughs> we are not living in a jungle. We are not living in a state governed by the rule of law and the constitution. And it will be very, very uh, unfortunate uh, to see our institutions continue to behave this way. They did that in war. You know, um, uh, they did that in Ashana recently, and, and now they are doing it in uh, uh, Garu. And, and it's becoming a pattern of behavior of our military. And uh, we intend this morning in Parliament to call them to order. Uh, the whole idea that any time that young people assault anybody who is a military officer, the public will, will, will suffer collectively is, is an unacceptable you know, proposition, uh, especially when sometimes the, the people who are assaulted are not physically in military uniform at the time of the alleged assault. So in the case of Garu, for instance, the people who were there were not in military uniform. Uh, they were in a vehicle that was not numbered. The number plate was not even there. And then the young people approached them to try and find out why they were there. Because their vehicle was covered in dust. And they themselves told the young people who approached them that, oh, they were lost. So the young people said, oh, there's a police station nearby. Let's go to the police station. So they drove themselves with the guidance of these young people who were on a motorbike ahead of them to the police station. And at the police station, 
the wrong people as well. Can you identify them? So they saw the national security uh, uh, operatives. And then they said, oh, we've had incidents of people who claimed they were national security operatives, but then it turned out that they probably were not or that they, 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 they participated in criminality whilst we perceived them to be national security operatives. So we want to have your vehicle searched. So the youth demanded that the vehicle should be searched. And then the vehicle was finally searched by the police. And when the vehicles were searched, they saw um, you know, arms and ammunition, and bulletproof vests and you know, pistols and uh, automatic rifles. So the young people you know, got a bit apprehensive about who they were. They insisted they were national security personnel, and the, the guy said no, they didn't believe them. So there was some you know, altercation and then you know, some mob gathered around the police station. And uh, in that milieu, uh, somebody is alleged to have passed by and then fired shots into the police station and then hit uh, the, the vehicle. And uh, I was called. I was called uh, in the heat of the, the developments. I, I called the national security minister to confirm if indeed those were his men. And he confirmed to me that those were men sent by them to carry out an operation. And I called some of the people who uh, called me to confirm that uh, they were people from the security uh, intelligence agency, so they should let them, you know, go. And, um, you know, I thought that was the end of the matter, uh, only to be told uh, of this, you know, incident that took place. Uh, the wee hours of uh, the morning that it took place. So, yeah, I mean, there was an incident, it is regrettable, but the response of the military is disproportionate, and I think that we must all condemn that. Well, would you, would you ask for investigations into it? Oh, definitely. We will call for an investigation in, in Parliament this morning. Hmm. And what would you want the investigation to establish? Well, I mean, just to establish the fact that the military went there and did what they did, and then uh, uh, call for some reprimand of the officers who led that whole operation. And what happens to the victims? The victims have remedies open to them. Um, they can go to the Human Rights Commission and lodge a complaint, and the Human Rights Commission will uh, pursue the matter and then uh, consider appropriate compensation. Honorable, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very, you very much, much for spending time with us this morning. Honorable um, Mahama Ayari, guys, Member of Parliament for Boku Central. We started this conversation from um, the petition sent to the OSP Office of the Special Prosecutor. I said he's here to hear from them. It all relates to the new office building of the Bank of Ghana. How uh, something that was supposed to